Hello, and welcome to the Inheritance Podcast. I'm Joe Riley. Today, we are talking to Lewis Lapham, author of the book, Money and Class in America, Notes and Observations on Our Civil Religion. Lewis was the longtime editor of Harper's Magazine and author of over a dozen books. He is currently founder and editor of Lapham's Quarterly. I want to start with a quote, and this is Tina Brown in her diaries, June 21st, 1984 ran into the Harper's editor, waspy, sardonic Lewis Lapham, who said to Harry, who of course is Harold Evans, have you ever, have you caught the New York disease? What's that? Money madness, Lapham said. He's writing a book on the subject, fiddling with your calculator all the time, doing little sums on scraps of paper, knowing you will never quite have enough. It's the sickness of the town. How did he know? What were you thinking when you were writing this book? The book comes out of columns that I started writing when I became editor of Harper's Magazine, notebooks, a monthly column. And when I'm starting to write it in 1979, 1980, I was supposed to make comments what was passing in the news, whether it was sex in Hollywood or politics in Washington or Jesus in Texas. But the subject that was always in the news was money. It was always at the top of the hour and the top of the page. My reasons for writing it were to keep up with the tenor and spirit of the times, but also for personal reasons, because I'd grown up under the protection and fear of money. And I was trying to rid myself of this superstition that makes money a god, which is what we were doing in the 1980s, and we are sad to say still doing in the year of our Lord 2022. Because I was a member of the high-end press, but also an inheritor of some wealth, not much, but I always had to work for a living. I, I grew up in a family that owned oil companies and shipping companies in Pacific Heights in San Francisco in the 30s. The uh, sort of the unspoken noble lie was that money is the elephant always in the room and that its will is done heaven on earth. In other words, the ancient and safe assumption was one that actually came down from the Puritans in England in in the early 17th century. America was not founded as a democracy. America, like Rockefeller, Standard Oil, and Zuckerberg's Facebook, is founded on the dream of riches to preserve, protect, and defend the means of acquiring and accumulating wealth of all denominations, spiritual, temporal, animal, vegetal, mineral, fruits of the earth, treasure in heaven. I mean, this is the point of the Puritan city on a hill. It's actually a temple of mammon, and and they say so. You told me last time we spoke that the critics put the book down when it came out in 88. What do you think happened? Well, they were unwilling to recognize such a thing as class. I mean, they they took it as on faith that America is egalitarian at birth, a classless society, but that's never been true. And so here they were telling me that I was writing about something that didn't exist, but it, it was very hard for me to accept that criticism because I was actually a member of the ruling class. I'd been brought up in it. I've been brought up under the fear and protection of money, which is the way, which is lutocracy. There have actually been very few moments in the history of America where we actually have had democracy in charge of the course of political ideas. It was Tocqueville in 1830 and travels in America and actually sees democracy at work because there's no, we have no central government, we have no national currency, and if anything is to be done, we have to do for ourselves. He sees this. He travels all over the United States, the Ohio River, Mississippi. River, New York, New Orleans, and he sees people helping each other, doing for themselves. And he says they do it because it's useful, not because it's morally superior. It's the same thing that Tom Paine says, that the best kind of government, the best society is when the people mutually and naturally support one another. Tocqueville sees that going on in the United States in the antebellum years up to the Civil War. After this, the Civil War puts all the authority and money with it's a plutocracy 
which is described ironically by Henry Adams in his novel Democracy, published in the 1880s, and by Twain, who describes the Gilded Age. He coins the phrase, and he says that that a society that adds to the sum of its vanity and greed is not a society at all. It is a state of war. That's repeated by Cleveland in in the 1880s and said the, the United States divides into two parts, the democracy on the one side, property on the other. Democracy stages a resurgence with a populist movement in the 1880s and then progressive movement and with the backing of both the Republican president, Teddy Roosevelt, and the Democratic president, Wilson. And that's when we get a lot of the early strategies in the New Deal. But that is that progressive moment is wiped out by World War One, And so in the 20s, you've got a society that is once again run on the premise that money is the divine power from which all blessings flow. That's the Hoover administration, that's the Roaring Twenties, the Jazz Age, and that leads Justice Brandeis to say, speaking of the New Deal, to Roosevelt, we must make our choice. We may have democracy or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. And that's the same pitch that Reagan made when he comes into office in the 1980s. And then it's the same pitch that uh, Trump makes. He comes down the elevator, so the deus ex machina and says more or less, not in so many words, but he says, democracy is for losers. Money is power, and power, ladies and gentlemen, is not self-sacrificing or democratic. Name of the game, nature of the beast. And it's that attitude that is subject of the observations in this book. You just alluded to this, and in an interview you gave at the time, you said the book had an element of exorcism in it, and that it was as much a self-examination as it was social criticism. Right. I was trying to root out my own superstition about money. I was trying to get free of the idea that money is God. (laughs) I I was trying to escape. I've I've not managed to completely do so, but I've come a long way. Lapham pushes the idea that the memoir form might influence any piece, an essay, report, investigation, and make it more rather than less true. Do you feel that that's true? Yeah. Yeah. You try to be honest with yourself. History is not just a series of events, right? That's Gibbon says that history is the register of the crimes, follies of mankind, but that sells it short. The past living in the present and the present living in the past, it's an enormous storehouse of human consciousness. It's an inexhaustible source of energy. The study and reading of history It gives you a chance of finding out who you are and uh, where you are and even where you might be going. But unless you know what kind of structure of ideas you're living in, you don't have much chance of, of breaking free. Did you think of yourself as being part of the new journalism? Back in the 70s, did you think of yourself as encouraging the form? No, I, I, I was still writing the old journalism. I was trying to infuse my writing. I was a contract writer for the Saturday Evening Post right. in the 60s. The, I wrote long form journalism, but it wasn't all about me. In other words, it was I, I tried to get the detail into the story. The details matter. The details that I chose obviously reflected my own approach. So to that extent, I was into the new journalism. I I didn't take it to the extreme that, say, Tom Wolfe did. I I didn't think that the new journalism, by some of its practitioners, gave them license to play fast and loose with the facts, and I I never took it to that extreme. That makes sense. There's One of my favorite stories of yours was from The Post. You went to visit a Texas oil man, and you went to a party at his house. Yeah. And you based the entire article is basically you just walking around the house describing yeah. what yeah. you're seeing and, and what everybody says. And there's yeah. no, there's very little commentary. The commentary is the story, is the observations. That's, that's right. But you're not really imposing yourself on the form. No, no, no. And I try to do the same thing in this book, Money in Class. I'm trying to discover myself as well as to discover what is going on in the room or, or what is being said or who is saying what to whom and where their observations are coming from. Do you think this book fits in with your larger 
oeuvre? Where do you place it on your own shelf? I, I, I place it pretty high up, actually. It's a portrait of an age. You know, it, it's, uh, it's a history of my, to some extent, of, of my own experience. But I'm trying to fit the experience into the surrounding mise-en-scene. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where these ideas come from. So maybe tell us a little bit about that age. Tell us about the 1980s, this party you were at with Tina Brown. She also mentions, by the way, that she was sitting in between you and Donald Trump at a party one night and that you very conveniently paid more attention to the woman on your left so that you wouldn't have to engage with him very much. Yes. The, uh, well, Trump was saying the same thing. This was, this book, Money and Class in America, was published in 1980. Eight. The scene that Tina is describing was a book party for this book given by the then publisher, who was a woman named Ann Getty, who had bought the book. The book was published by uh, Weidenfeld, and it was accepted by Ari Evans, who was then briefly at Weidenfeld. Ann Getty bought the publishing house, gave a party for the book, and invited Trump as the sort of guest of honor because Trump in 1988 was the poster child of, of the Gilded Age. He was on the cover of Time magazine. He was on the cover of Playboy magazine. The kids at Yale in, in 1988 had photographs of Trump on their walls in the same place of honor where in the 60s they would have had photographs of Che or Dylan. Trump was what was the hero of the age. And Newhouse, when he bought the Random House or New York or whatever he did, the first book he published was Trump's Art of the Deal, which was at the top of the bestseller list. It was up there in lights with Wall Street, the movie by Oliver Stone, and Tom Wolfe's On Fire of the Vanity. And Trump was staying at dinner. Trump was not supposed to stay to dinner. He was just supposed to come. He not read the book, obviously, but he was just supposed to come and bless it with the Midas touch and then depart, trailing clouds of glory and his signature men's colognes, which were called Empire and Success. <laughs> but he stayed to dinner and suddenly started talking. And, he, and he, he was saying the same thing at dinner in 1988 that he was saying in the campaign of 2016. Money is power, and power, ladies and gentlemen, is not self-sacrificing or democratic. And if it's a choice between money in the hands of a few as opposed to democracy, my choice is for money in the hands of the few, which is the same choice that was made by Reagan, made by Clinton, made by both George Bush, and made by Obama. We live in a society where money has the last and final word. And it is the synonym for freedom. You can have freedom if you can afford it. That's the way our society is set up. I'd like to talk about Nelson Aldrich, sadly recently deceased, the author of the other great book about money in the 1980s called Old Money. You're right. Of course, your longtime friend, born to the equestrian class, but had to work for a living. You worked together at Harper's and I think he used to do the wraparound or was an editor for a while. What was it like uh, working with Nelson? It was fun working with Nelson. He didn't do the wraparound. He was, he was a senior editor. He was responsible as I was for what was in the magazine. And he had a sense of, he was a good writer. I can remember publishing two long articles by him in the magazine, one about Harvard University of which he was very critical, even though he had been a graduate of Harvard. But the, uh, and the other was about his, his own alcoholism, right? which I allowed him to publish under a pseudonym. But it was a, it was a brilliant piece of writing. Elfenor, yeah. It's El a... El Elfenor was the, you know, the oarsman on Odysseus's ship. Right. He fell off the roof. Yeah. And then Odysseus runs into him in Hades. It's, it's a great... Yeah. Uh, yeah. But Nelson, you know, had a very sweet temperament. He was a very generous man. The uh, in, in many ways, like George Plimpton, Nelson, I think, had also at an earlier point in his life had been a, one of the early editors of the Paris Review. Isn't that right? And, yes. Uh, and he was a friend of George, but he was... I never heard George say a mean word about anybody. George was always looking for the best of people, which is the democratic way of looking at one fellow man, right? And Nelson had the same predilection, attitude, empathetic. So many of our critics attempt to put other people down. That's what's happened to our political discourse. And that's why it's polarized. People try to make enemies out of each other instead of friends. And the true democratic idea is 
the people naturally mutually supporting one another. I'm tolerant of your views, even though they differ from mine, because I'm, I protect your political freedom and on the assumption that you will protect mine. It's a democracy is a common enterprise and it's work. It has to be done every day. It's no good on television. The camera worships money and worships celebrity, beautiful, famous, or rich. And you've got to become these days with, with that kind of assumption. I mean, to become elected president, you have to first become a celebrity. I can remember being as appalled in 1980 with the election of Reagan as some people were appalled in 20. 16 with the election of uh, Trump. I thought, what in God's name are we doing electing a B-list actor to become president of the United States? But then I understood that he was being elected to entertain us. Politics had become show business. And we have a sham democracy, which we pretend still exists in this country, but doesn't doesn't exist because we don't have the, the inner conviction and the spirit of it, which is the helping each other. Nelson had that. So did Plimpton. You and George both cultivated some great authors, but your magazines obviously had very different cultures. How did you think about writers versus George? George, most of the writers that I were unpublished, you know, George, George uh, liked to publish writers that already had some reputation. Philip Roth and, and, and so on. The Paris Review interviews, which are one of the strongest features of the magazine. And the, uh, but I was always willing to take a chance on people you never heard of. <laughs> Manuscripts that would come in over the transom or on the basis of a simple letter. Somebody would write me a letter and say, I want to write a piece about this. I could tell by the way they were writing the letter, I'd tell them to go for it, take a chance, have fun writing it. I, I wanted to publish writers that had fun writing it, you know, that were free to bet their the whole pot on a metaphor. I also was more interested in, in essays than, than George was. George was more interested in short stories. Nelson's book is a really nice compliment, I would think, to Henry Adams, while yours is a compliment to Tocqueville. How do you think his work differed from yours? His was more narrowly focused. I was trying to get into the worship of money as it shows up in culture, in the media, in education, across the whole texture of a society that judges people as well as paintings by the price of the thing rather than the worth of the thing. That to me is the major mistake with plutocracy. And I was trying to show that up in foreign policy as well as in the class behaviors of a privileged class. And, and Nelson was focused more directly on the, the details of the class distinctions. Lewis Nelson's book claimed that the, the WASP elite had a sense of duty, but the question is, did they have a moral authority? And where did it come from? He felt like the upper class meant something and was supposed to represent some high ideals and sense of a community, but it ultimately failed. I think that's the message that I got from his book. Does that resonate with you as well? Well, yes. You can say that Henry Adams is the last of the Brahmins and the first of the wasps. And there is the tradition that comes down through the 19th century, and you can see it in, in Henry Adams's ancestors. You see it in John Adams. You see it in John Quincy Adams. There is a sense of duty. There is, there is a sense of loyalty to the Constitution. Lincoln makes a very good statement about that somewhere in the 1840s. But it has a strong element of the Christian religion in it too. Essentially do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The Again, the notion of working at, at bringing more good into the world. Nelson and I were the same age and we're in college and there's a great sense of that. Yale in the 1950s and I assume in Harvard in the 1950s. 50s too, which is the, to those who much has been given, much is expected in return. The faculty were constantly making speeches on that. So were the ministers in the pulpits on, on the Sunday. In other words, it was unselfish, what's called disinterested, which means one wasn't in it just for one's own magnificence or power or money. One was in it, into it for a higher good. And, and so that at Yale in the 19th 1950s, a majority of the class went on to become doctors, teachers, ministers.
writers, even journalists, but journalists in before the new journalism as a servants of the Republic. The idea that it was, if you enjoyed the benefit of this society, you were expected and obliged to share that benefit. And there was that feeling relatively few people in the 50s went into Wall Street. There were those that did, but there were more that went into one or another of the public service callings. And that, that had all gone by 1980 when Bart Giamatti, he was a friend of mine, and becomes president of Yale in, I think, 1979, 1980. And to his horror, by 1984, half the class is applying to Goldman Sachs. That's why Trump is on the wall in, in the dormitory rooms. And that, was, that depressed Giamatti, and it depressed Nelson. Did your parents talk about the family wealth when you were growing up? No. So what were the messages about money in your household? My parents never talked about money. They made a point of it. It was uh, the same point that was made by money was the, the elephant always in the room, but never to be seen or addressed, but whose will is done on earth as it is in heaven. That was the message I got. And it was to be, and it didn't come as a message on a silver tray. It, it came, it was to be inferred by the weight of the silver tray. And the house was handsomely furnished with silver trays, and handsome, handsome views of the bay, and the servants knew their place. Did, did anyone ever talk to you or teach you how to handle money? Unfortunately not. My father was a banker, but came to banking late in life. He'd been president of a shipping company, and the, uh, he didn't understand money at all. He had no idea how to handle it. But that was okay if you were a banker in the 50s. That all changes in the 70s. Suddenly, the banks are taken over by the adventurers. Now, your father and your grandfather were very accomplished. Did they have high expectations or specific expectations for you? No. And your brother? No. No, no they go forth and, and find your calling. Did you think of yourself as wealthy? Did you feel like there was a class distinction when you were growing up? I didn't think of myself as wealthy, but I felt myself protected. I mean, I, I felt myself, I assumed that I'd arrived at birth, all the places that mattered. <laughs> That's the terrible thing with being brought up under the fear of money is that you, it kills ambition. It, it's why the energy drains out of a plutocracy. I didn't grow up as a plutocrat. I, I didn't grow up thinking that there was much, nothing money couldn't buy. And I grew up questioning the power of money. My father was an intellectual and the, was a great reader of 17th and 18th century prose. And I can remember my mother reading to me at the age of six, Melville's Moby Dick. But when I got around trying to explain ideas that were coming to me, my father, they always had to be translated into a cash equivalent. Well, how much is that idea worth? I mean, he didn't want me to go into the newspaper business because there was no money in it. Did you feel like you were under the shadow at all of, of your father and grandfather? I know there's some there's some sense in, in Nelson's work. I wouldn't say he struggled with it, but it certainly was something he's thought a lot about. No, I, I didn't feel that. I didn't feel the shadow. I had a very good relation with my grandfather. It was it was easier for me to talk to my grandfather than to talk to my father. And, and after Yale, I, I went to spend a year abroad in Cambridge studying medieval history. And there's a long correspondence back and forth between my grandfather and myself on what is democracy. He'd been mayor of San Francisco when I was growing up, and I used to accompany him sometimes on his campaign platform. He was a Republican, but he was really a Democrat with a small D, very open to other people. We didn't go around in a chauffeured car, drove himself, and he'd pick up hitchhike. And he never, he, just to talk to him, to see what they were thinking. The machine politicians in San Francisco tried to get him recalled. And each time, he did it twice. And each time he got reelected by a bigger vote. The, he campaigned on the promise that he would one term and he would call every shot the way he saw it and, and wouldn't be playing for future politics. By the end of his term, the party offered him to run for governor of California. And he said, no, I, I said I'd run one term and I'd mean it. And, and one of the first summers I was in San Francisco, while I was still at college, I spent the summer working for the San Francisco Chronicle. This is while I was still at Yale and, and the, lived with my grandparents and used to have breakfast with my grandfather and 
seven o'clock in the morning. He liked to have breakfast at a downtown cafeteria, Waldorf cafeteria. And he would talk to anybody, came up to talk to him. Did you, did you ever meet Nelson's father? No. Did he ever talk to you about his family? He talked to me about his being cheated out of his inheritance, I, I believe. He, well, from his I, mother or from his father? From his mother. From his mother, yeah. Yeah. He, he writes about that in, in, in American Benefactor, he wrote about it. Yeah. yeah. The, I think she gave the money to the housekeeper. That's right. Right. Yeah. But he had a good relationship with his dad. I think so. Have you known anyone in New York over the years who you thought used their wealth well? Yes, a man named Ben Rosen, who his wife Donna is or was on our board of directors. He invented a company, but then spent a lot of it in various philanthropic ways, but educating himself and helping other people. Also, John D. Rockefeller III. I worked for John D. Rockefeller III one year as his private secretary for about three months on, a t on his tour. Of, he used to make a tour to Asia every year because he had a number of philanthropic interests in Asia, quite a few of them, actually. Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, Bangkok, New Delhi. And I accompanied him for three months. And he knew the names of everybody that he was dealing with. He, he cared. And he and he knew what he was doing. It wasn't just some gift for your name on a building. And I thought he used it very well, his wealth. You and Mark Twain were born 100 years apart and both observed a dramatically changed country over your lifetimes. Yeah. Do you feel more simpatico with Twain than with your own contemporaries? Oh, yes, right, I do. <laughs> did you finish the autobiography? I did. Where do you think he fits into the writer's pantheon? I think he's, uh, I, I put him up there with Melville, with Henry Adams, Edith Wharton. I, I put him in the first, in the front row. I, I put Jefferson in the front row too, and Lincoln. Is there, uh, in your own 70 years of observing American democracy, has anything changed for the better? Yes. I mean, the, the, uh, a lot of good things have been done. That's an interesting question. I'd have to make a list because it would have to be specific. And I, I right off the top of my head, I wouldn't know which ones, but I, I don't think... I don't think in a general way it's changed for the better. I, I would find it hard to do that. I, I think the sense of freedom that was in the air growing up in California in, in the uh, 40s and 50s, I feel much less free these days. We have a heavy surveillance state, right? We have people constantly afraid of, of the future. World War II is, is fought by a citizen army, and, and people were not afraid of the future. The we did a whole issue on democracy. I think there's been a loss of the democratic spirit over the course of my lifetime. I think it was alive and well and coming out of the New Deal, coming out of World War II. I mean, there have been gains with civil rights and so, so forth. I mean, but the general feeling of the society these days to me is much less free. I feel like I'm being, I know I'm being constantly watched. I know that if the government chooses to do so, they can open my mail, tap my phone. The, I know that the, the internet, Google and Facebook work as surveillance, track your every move. The uh, author, Upton Sinclair, talks about the pecuniary standards of a culture that makes, that judges the excellence of a man by the amount of other people's happiness he can possess or destroy. And that's Facebook. That's also the banks that put so many members of our society in lifelong debt. Debt is a way to deprive people of their freedom of movement and thought. So the more we get it hooked on debt, which our government is always encouraging us, to, the less our freedom of thought. Did you uh, know Christopher Lash well? No, but I'm a big admirer of his writing. I mean, I remember his, we, we published the, the, the book about the culture of narcissism, pre-published that in Harper's Magazine in the 70s. I learned a lot from him. I wanted to congratulate you. The quarterly is coming up on 15 years. How's, how are oh, yeah. things going there? Well, it's good. We're, we've got our head above water. We're making, I mean, it, it, circulation keeps going up, but we, we're a foundation. So we depend to some extent upon philanthropic gifts, but we do philanthropic work. We give it away to schools, community colleges, prisons. We've just been accepted by uh, 130 prisons in California and another 84 prisons in Texas. And that's, that's good. That's where the magazine can do its a lot of good, but people like it. The book is Money and Class in America. The author is Lewis Lapham. 
Thank you, Lewis. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We appreciate it.